Welcome back to The Talking Hedge. I'm Josh Kincaid, and this is your Cannabis Business Podcast. Today, we're going to dive into cannabis investment activity, utilizing reports from MJ Business Daily, as well as talking about Kushko Holdings and some issues they're having with some capital raises. On the line with us to talk about all of this is Katrina Golgowski. She is an attorney and angel investor. Thanks for being back on the podcast. Morning, Josh. So this uh, chart of the week is talking about year-over-year summaries for global cannabis industry capital raises. Um, And so this article goes on to say that the capital investment in 2019 hit a $10.5 billion cap uh, through week 40, a 40% increase year-over-year, but the previously hot investment activity has cooled in recent months and now is running at what one analyst called more normal pace of growth. So while total cannabis capital raises is up 460 percent from 2017 to 2019, recent activity has showed that the total capital raised during that time increased by only 40 percent at almost three billion. So by comparison, capital raises through week 40 were up 300 percent. That's 5.6 billion. So number of raises was up over the same period uh, during September as it was in 2018. But the average size and total capital raises were down year over year. So Katrina, would you agree that this is more normal for industries to kind of have less amount of deals, um, maybe even less dollar amounts, but but just normalizing in general? I think this is indicative of two different factors. The first, folks with money in their pocket rushed in early. Uh, If you had money in your pocket, you wanted to get in early. And second, the industry as as a whole is starting to normalize and you're not seeing brand new ideas. You're not seeing revolutionary ideas in the last year or so because those brand new revolutionary ideas came a little sooner. And I am seeing a slowdown in investment across the board, not no investment, just slowing down uh, the, those folks that had their mo- the money in their pocket in 2017, 2018, they've already spent it. I've definitely seen a lot of that. And I also am wondering, maybe you can give me your take on it too. Um, do you think it's a lack of distribution experience? Cause you could have a great idea. I really liked um, in 2015, some of the stuff that we saw at, at the expos and conferences um, like the the Casher and uh, some of these other like lighter bros and the ancillary markets w- with creativity um, has really ceased. I'm, I'm not seeing a lot of that. And I'm wondering if is if it's not because of the lack of ideas, but but the lack of distribution. And, you know, once you have an idea, that's great and all, but how do you get it to sell? There's There's two points in that comment, Josh. The first is you can have the best idea ever, If you can't get it on the shelf, nobody's going to buy it. And there's a lot of hesitancy, especially now in the, in the vape pen area, there is a lot that can still happen with, with vape units, not just for nicotine, but for cannabis as well. We saw a lot last year of getting smaller and smaller and smaller uh, to, to cater to that market that doesn't want to scream cannabis user. But at the same time, I, I, when we were at the shows last year, I haven't seen a lot of those products on the shelf. So why not? Uh, I, I, I really can't answer that question. I'm not in distribution or retail. But at the same time, I was hoping to see some of these products because I myself personally thought smaller was better. And then the second piece is the development of the new idea. Uh, Again, I think there was a rush of people that were in this industry for the medicinal market uh, that came out with their ideas. And now you're seeing a little bit more R&D, especially when you start talking about corporate money. Uh, They wanna see R&D, they wanna see prototypes, they wanna see a little bit more uh, development before those new ideas are funded. So it's twofold. And it's interesting too, with not just the lack of capital, but some of the retrenchment in, in employment. So we've seen Hexco lay off uh, 24% of their workforce, Pax Labs laid off at least a fifth of their workforce, Weed Maps laid off another, um, I think, 20, 25% of their workforce. 
Um, and, and there's more than that. This article says, quote, current conditions are closer to normal. The prior year or two of almost unlimited capital to burn without showing profits was abnormal, said Craig Burns of an equity analyst at MJ uh, Daily's Investor Intelligence. So rather than raising costs for concern, the, the slowdown is natural part of the investment cycle. So when he goes on to say that the investment investors being more judicious and pressing companies to focus on profitability is actually a sign of healthy, rational capital markets and the competition for re resources uh, forces companies to run more efficiently as evidenced by the layoffs. Absolutely, Josh. Let's not forget, cannabis is new. Cannabis is exciting. And People want to play with cannabis. We've heard green rush over and over and over again. But cannabis is still a business. If you are running a car company, you better make a car. If you make a car, you would better sell that car. And you better control costs. So I think the slowdown that we are seeing is in fact a normalization of the market, just like any other industry. Cannabis is, isn't different. No, it's not different. I would also say, though, that I think there's been a lack of um, involvement from advisors or board members or just a lack of accountability to let somebody or a company scale like that without really looking at, at the bigger picture. And I think that um, being in cannabis has maybe limited amounts of advisors or capital and people just throwing everything they have at it until it no longer works. And so normal companies, I don't think would operate like that with the exception of, of maybe a we work or something crazy. Normal companies aren't allowed to run as freely. And, and maybe it's the lack of understanding and how cannabis works where companies were, were given an unlimited amount of leeway almost in terms of how to onboard employees to the point of you know, oversubscribing employees. And, and so having to let go 50% is drastic. Even the banking industry, which is crumbling, is only laying off 20%. So to see 25, 50%, that's not normal. I agree with that. And that might be exuberance. That might be, hey, we just had a big raise, so we can try this, try that, didn't work, now we gotta lay the people off. There, there's a variety of reasons for it, but it's just a normalization of the market. And to get to your earlier comment of sort of how we got here, to think of something simple like a CPA. Every corporation in America has a CPA. If you have shareholders, you have duties to those shareholders. One of the primary ways of meeting those duties is with finances. Who handles the finance? CPA. As late as 2017, 2018, the regulations that govern and, and restrict CPAs uh, with their licensing and their guidances were basically saying, don't play with cannabis. So sometimes it's hard for legitimate, valid companies who play with cannabis to access the traditional corporate resources that other industries have. And maybe that's part of it. Maybe CPAs weren't balancing the books. I, I don't know, but I, I am personally aware that CPAs were in a very difficult position when it came to cannabis. Yeah, there are some CPAs out in the industry, um, lawyers and accountants, some bankers, um, but I find that the, the finance professionals are few and far between, the people that can really look at the analytics behind it, um, get set up with M&As or you know, just a, a football field analysis with a handful of metrics to know whether that deal is accretive or dilutive is few and far between. So hopefully they can increase the number of finance professionals uh, on the team so that they can uh, move forward more efficiently in the future. Yeah. Another factor playing a role in the investment slowdown is the type of investors entering the space. As marijuana investment has become more mainstream, traditional investors have increasingly brought their money to the table. With traditional players come traditional expectations, those that rely on tangible results. So here's what you need to know about cannabis investment. From 2018 to 2019, the number of year-to-date capital raises during the first 40 weeks increased 6%. 
So through week 40 of this year, the average size of capital raise was 21.3 million, up 31% from last year's averages. And then cultivation and retail has been the driving force behind marijuana capital raises and mergers and acquisitions through this year, which is interesting because retail was really at the first half of the year with MSOs. Second half of 2019 has really been all about cultivation. Uh, Cure Leaf in California was a, almost a billion dollar acquisition. Um, and there's been one in Oregon. And so these eight, $900 million deals, even a, a $12 million deal in Oregon with TJ's provisions, that's the retail shop for TJ's, uh, it's not TJ's organics anymore. I can't remember TJ's. He's a yeah, good flower, worth every penny uh, out there. Phenomenal grower, one of the best I've, I've seen. And so, yeah, again, uh, retail um, first half, cultivation second half. Are you seeing the same thing? Yes, I have seen this generally. So when we came out of the gate, you have to grow cannabis in order to sell cannabis. Now, with the constriction, with the oversupply that we're seeing uh, in Washington and Oregon, not so much in California, but certainly Washington and Oregon, the lack of verticalization, these types of things, the investment went to retail. And now all those farmers that closed in 2017, well, 2018, early 2019, uh, forced a undersupply in some states. And so now you see the pendulum swinging back to cultivation. Uh, retail, retail is all about location, 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 but growing, if there's nothing on the shelf, doesn't matter where your retail location is. So that, and also, I think the constriction of farmers, uh, cultivators, and growers was because they couldn't control the cost of goods sold. And this is a licensing issue where when you can only grow 10,000 square feet, how it's very hard to control your cost of goods sold. So when you have M&A in cultivation, it actually makes sense because you can have multiple licenses on, on one spot and grow in accordance with generally accepted agricultural standards, which is plant a, a whole bunch of it in order to control the cost of goods sold. And then the second point in that article was, again, talking about the normalization of the market where you're, you're traditional investor starts coming in and that is also where you want financials you want a business plan you know if the talking hedges seven tips to a good pitch deck is what what investors are looking for now because you're not targeting the high risk investor anymore you're not talking uh to the green rush i have unlimited amounts of money in my pocket let's let's have a billion dollar investment for a new uh rolling paper uh, that that those days are gone hmm. now what's your ibida and if you don't know what ibida is why are you talking to me mm -hmm. just normalization that's all it is Definitely. I'm, I'm a little worried about uh, the multi-state operators kind of gobbling up real estate at, at the peak of commercial prices, you know, in the history of commercial prices. So hopefully with the, um, you know, cracks in the economy and, and a certain unpredictability that those companies won't have to liquidate uh, in the event that commercial prices do uh, correct or come down. That's certainly part of it, Josh, which is what, how are you going to control your cost of goods sold, which includes the cost of the real estate? Right. And we're seeing a lot of that in Washington where there's zero ability to control your cost of goods sold because the retailer holds all of that power. Unlike places like Colorado, where a retailer uh, is also a producer processor in many cases selling their own brand. But without that vertical integration opportunity here in Washington, we're seeing some of the most competitive uh, markets in, in, in all of North America really here where retail shops sh literally share the same parking lot. It's right. difficult to manage uh, how the shops sell and even uh, the cost of goods sold all the way down to the, the producer. And, and it's not only producer processors and retailers, it's ancillary businesses that are having a tough time too. There's capital constraints everywhere. 
Um, and in fact, the Herbery is a local retail shop here in Washington and they can't renew their lease because the bank won't let the landlord. Landlord doesn't care, the bank. So there's really a, a lot of interesting things happening right now. Cushco Holdings recently had a, a capital raise and highlights some capital crunch uh, details for the cannabis industry. And so it kind of shocked the industry, according to this uh, article from equities.com, when Cushco Holdings announced an equity raise in late September, the raise came in the middle of the cannabis deceleration, which led to the company's stock collapsing by 50% within the course of a week. So while the sell-off is ob obviously gut-wrenching, while the company turned to the financing markets is more of a red flag for investors. And I would echo that too, uh, Katrina, because anytime we work or, or these companies go public, it always asks me, why? Why do you want to lose control? Do you need the money? Why do you need the money? Why now? And every time that the market is about to dip, all these companies come on board, just like Facebook did, um, uh, um, Snapchat. All it's, The timing is, is interesting to me because once the easy money is over, they want to go public and then all the insiders get out. Agreed why a cannabis company would go uh ipo right now is a is a question i would ask the management what's the purpose why so the details of this Kushko uh, fiasco is that they announced the sale of a 17 million dollar worth of shares at a dollar 75 per share price point the company also had to offer buyers one warrant exercisable at two dollars and 25 cents per share for the next five years so Net proceeds were estimated at 28 million. By the looks of it, the terms of the deal have tough decisions written all over it from a management perspective, leading many to believe that the company was going to run out of cash. So Kushko showed signs that they needed capital back in May as they reported only 12 million in cash, um, while they were going net losses closer to 33 million. So looking at uh, $12 million in the bank, potential $28 million from a dilutive raise in September, and another $35 million from a credit line, the company was continuing to expand its operations into new markets, so it's entirely possible that the company wasn't out of the woods. So now Kushko Holdings is an ancillary provider to the cannabis industry, providing bottles and other equipment, so oversupply and slow rollouts were hitting them, and that's exactly why uh, Weed Maps had to lay off what closer to 50% is because of the quote slow rollouts in California. But Katrina, can't you just see that crystal ball from every single rollout, including Canada? I think that history is replete with examples of normalization and leveling off. Cannabis is no different than any other industry. Is it easy to predict? No. Uh, but is it within the realm of possibility when you are doing your plans for an IPO, when you're doing your business plan, that the market is going to level off, that prices are going to drop? Yes. Yeah, it's kind of like the same example, uh, you know, we just mentioned before, which is that there's not a lot of accountability for some of these companies expanding without realistic expectations. They're sort of taking the hype and, and thinking that's going to be a long-term solution um, maybe just overall lacking a strategy. Or a plan. <laughs> so while capital markets aren't totally closed off the cannabis companies, prices are at multi-year lows. Cush Co. Holdings had to act in order to keep the lights on. You might see more companies making that choice in the future. In the meantime, investors should look for value stocks with strong balance sheets as a capital crunch might further squeeze companies on the bubble. I definitely would, would agree with that. I am seeing some opportunities, though, uh, with a potential floor in the overall market being met. There was a Fibonacci retracement of about 62% from the March all-time highs. So if you're looking at it from like a chartist or a technical standpoint, not fundamentals, the fundamentals are broken, okay? I'm just talking strictly trading, not investing. Um, and by the way, the, this is all for entertainment purposes only. <laughs> but... Uh, this AI-based algorithm that we're going to be talking about later on today is kind of showing signs that the overall market is reaching a floor um, with a support level, uh, and it's kind of bouncing in between. Um, unfortunately, there isn't a whole lot of options for, for straddles and spreads to kind of play that, um, but do understand that there is kind of a, a floor and that we could see an increase, especially if the market collapses, because what we've seen with vice stocks is an inverse relationship, right? So whether it's 
uh, cannabis or tobacco or alcohol, there could be uh, a parabolic shift where massive speculation comes into the industry because of Tina. The Tina market is there is no alternative. Uh, I do think that for an investor who wants to get into this market today, do your due diligence. Again, just because it's cannabis doesn't give them a blank check. Uh, make sure the financials are in order, make sure the leadership team is in order, and make sure they have a plan. That's the seven tips to a successful pitch deck that we keep talking about. Use it. Um, these are indicators of potential success for a business, especially where they've put some thought into these ideas. You don't want to just say, oh, hey, you're going to you're going to do this with your cannabis and you're going to have neon yellow glow in the dark pre-rolled joints. So what? Doesn't mean it's a good idea. Do your due diligence and and don't just randomly write a check. As far as the market, I think there are going to be opportunities and as far as the overall stock market uh struggling uh and people turning to vice, absolutely. Because when you're not happy, for whatever reason, you are going to turn to those vices and there is a potential for a turnaround. But just do your due diligence and, and figure out what this company that you are thinking of investing in, what it's going to do. Uh, is it really different? Is it set apart? from everybody else and most importantly do they have the team to lead it like with kushko they might have waited a little too long to do their capital raise which caused problems so that's why you need a team in place which can help the company ride through the storm yeah, definitely uh, get a team that's not going to be a bobblehead and just tell you what you want to hear. You need a complete team in order to give you all of the advice from finance to marketing and everything in between and not be afraid to tell you what you don't want to hear, which is maybe that the timing right now isn't the best to go public. I'm just going to have to come back to the talking heads and find out. So I want to thank my guest, Katrina Golkowski. She's an attorney and angel investor. Appreciate you being back on the podcast. Thanks, Josh. With that, we're going to roll this one up. I'm Josh Kincaid. This is The Talking Hedge. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Or don't. And I'm out.